Hello, and welcome everyone. My name is Selena, and I'm a part of the team at the Foundation for Inner Peace. It's a pleasure to welcome you to our ACIM movie meetup. Today, we are delighted to present the two-part documentary, The Story of A Course in Miracles, which offers a profound exploration into the origins and impact of what students around the world affectionately call The Course. As many of you know, the Foundation for Inner Peace is the scribe authorized publisher of A Course in Miracles. The first printings of the course were made in 1975, and the first hardcover books were published in 1976. Our mission has always been to publish, distribute, and discuss this transformative work. Through events like these, we aim to extend love through course teachings. With A Course in Miracles 50th anniversary on the horizon in 2025, today provides an opportunity to reflect on the remarkable journey that brought this message of true forgiveness into the world. The documentary we are about to view, The Story of A Course in Miracles, was directed by Bridget Winter and produced in 1987. Part 1, The Forgotten Song, explores how the course came to be, focusing on the unlikely collaboration between doctors Helen Shuckman and William Thetford, who together scribed this profound work. Dr. Kenneth Wapnick, whose expertise in psychology and spirituality brought him into close collaboration with Helen and Bill, he played a pivotal role in the course's development. We'll also see how Judith Scutch Whitson, co-founder of the Foundation for Inner Peace, was entrusted with the manuscript and took on the pivotal role of publishing and introducing the course to the world. In part two, the song Remembered will witness how the course profoundly impacted the lives of its early students. This event is not just a viewing. It's a chance to connect and reflect. You are encouraged to share your thoughts, experiences, and insights in the group chat. This is a space for us to come together for learning and gratitude. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you that simultaneous Spanish translation is available for those who need it. We are thankful to all those who paved the way for A Course in Miracles. As we continue to walk together on this journey, let us be reminded of the Course's profound teaching from Lesson 195, Love is the Way I Walk in Gratitude. Your participation here not only honors this legacy of love, your donations support the Foundation's ongoing work and our preparations for the Course's 50th anniversary celebration. So, without further ado, let's dive into the story of A Course in Miracles. Thank you for being here and for being a part of this journey with us. Listen. Perhaps you catch a hint of an ancient state not quite forgotten. Dim, perhaps, and yet not altogether unfamiliar. Like a song whose name is long forgotten and the circumstances in which you heard completely unremembered. Listen. Not the whole song has stayed with you, but just a little wisp of melody, attached not to a person or a place or anything particular. But you remember, from just this little part, how lovely was the song, how wonderful the setting where you heard it, and how you loved those who were there and listened with you. Listen. You 
1958, I accepted an appointment as professor of medical psychology at Columbia University's College of Physicians and Surgeons. Shortly after I arrived at Columbia, one of my first duties was to hire a research psychologist for a special collaborative study program. In the course of looking for the right person, I found Dr. Helen Shuckman. Helen and I worked together very closely for the next seven years on a wide variety of academic, professional, clinical, and administrative issues. For the most part, I think we worked quite effectively. But there was also a great deal of conflict and stress in our personal and professional relationships. In her unpublished autobiography, Helen, who died on February 9, 1981, described her reactions to her job and the highly stressful situations that existed there. I was a psychologist, educator, conservative in theory and atheistic in belief. I was working in a prestigious and highly academic setting, and the job was ghastly at first. The hospital didn't provide space for our projects, and when we were finally housed in the new research building, it was the most difficult situation of my professional life. The work was oppressive and carried out in an atmosphere of suspicion and competitiveness, and interpersonal harmony was depressingly lacking. Then something happened that triggered a chain of events I could never have predicted. My first impressions of Helen were a little difficult to define. She seemed to me to be a very complex person. On the one hand, she was obviously brilliant. She certainly had a very dedicated research orientation. On the other hand, there was a kind of peripheral feeling of orbiting, and I'm not quite sure how to define that, but a feeling that she was going in circles somehow. And it took me a while to realize that that was a very superficial impression and that any question I asked her uh, evoked a very uh, solid answer. Often, Helen and I would leave our offices in the late afternoon while we were working on a project or a paper and spend some time near my apartment in Central Park. I felt extremely close to Helen. I felt she was the one person who cared about what happened in my professional life. But I also think she felt a much closer personal relationship with me than I felt I could reciprocate. Bill is some 14 years younger than I and over a foot taller. He rarely attacked openly when he was angry or irritated, but was much more likely to become increasingly aloof and unresponsive. I, on the other hand, tended to become over-involved and then feel hopelessly trapped and resentful. Helen related in a very professional way with patients that with some people she tuned in immediately and had a great sense of rapport. She understood what they were like. She was able to perhaps see through their defenses and uh, was extremely practical. I was having some emotional difficulties, uh, largely with family matters. And uh, so Helen kindly counseled me. And in the course of this dialogue, a very kind exchange, uh, she discovered that uh, I had been separated from my mother for some 14 years, and I really wasn't quite sure where she was. It turned out that she was institutionalized. And within half an hour the next day, Helen located through some contacts in the State Department of Mental Health in New York State, uh, found where my mother was lodged, and had spoken to the physician in charge of my mother, and the following Sunday arranged for me to visit. And with Helen's support and help, I was uh, able to reestablish a, a very loving relationship uh, with my mother, uh, first as a friend and then as a loving son. 
and it was so typical of, of Helen's concern. We had worked together for a number of years, actually from 1958 until the summer of 1965, with a good deal of improvement in terms of the organization of the psychology department at the hospital, but we weren't really at peace. And one day I gave Helen a little speech. This was in June of 1965 before we were going to a meeting. Essentially what I said is, there must be a better way of living and working in the world, of handling our personal and professional relationships and problems, and I'm determined to find it. Uh, this was kind of a long speech for me, and I remember feeling at the end of this that Helen probably was going to laugh, but to my amazement, quite the contrary. She said, you're absolutely right, Bill. We'll find this other way together. And that was the beginning of a joint commitment which the two of us made. Helen was always very much involved in her work with mentally retarded children. She found particular gratification in working with children who had these handicaps and found them especially responsive and highly lovable. On the other hand, Helen would have been the first to assure any of us that she would not have made a good mother herself and had no wish to assume that role. When we walked in Central Park, as we often did, we would visit Lewis Carroll's Ellis in Wonderland near the boating pond, and that was one of Helen's favorite spots. On one of these occasions, Helen told me about a recurring childhood dream from which she never quite recovered. It centered on a red and yellow rubber ball, which showed up in many dreams over the years, and which she equated with unhappy aspects of her childhood. The ball was in the crib at the foot and my father came into the doorway, and I was lying there very happily, thinking how pretty I was and how warm. He just stayed there and looked and didn't come in, and I was very little, so I couldn't get up myself and go over. In the dream, I saw myself turn from a very pretty little girl into a very ugly one. And he just looked and then went away. So I did turn into a very ugly girl. I was fat and horrible and all the boys turned me down. My mother said I looked like an elephant and she couldn't stand it. Helen had a very lonely childhood. Her mother and father had lives of their own and she had nothing in common with her brother who was 14 years older. She spent most of her time with a Catholic governess and a Baptist cook. Helen's parents were non-observant Jews and there was no discouragement or interest when Helen started to experiment with being, at different times, Catholic and Baptist. After a long series of disappointments, Helen gave up her search for God, and when she became a graduate student in psychology, her beliefs shifted from agnosticism to angry atheism. But that, as it turned out, was not the real end of the story. Ever since I was a child, I would often see very clear pictures when I closed my eyes. The pictures could be of anything. A birthday cake with lighted candles, a woman with a dog, trees in the woods, 
a store window filled with shoes. For years, my mental pictures had usually been motionless and in black and white. I could become aware of them at any time, even with my eyes open. But suddenly they began to appear in color and in motion. And so did my dreams. The summer of 1965 was a, uh, an extraordinary summer for both Helen and me in a number of ways. Helen began to have a great deal of what you might call heightened visual imagery or dream sequences. Uh, she began to experience this with considerable clarity, and I suggested that she write down these experiences as they occurred because they seemed to have something, very, they were saying something very important, even though we didn't know exactly what that was. One of those sequences uh, involved being in a boat. was moving slowly but easily along a very straight little canal. There was just enough breeze to help the boat along. The sides of the canal were lined with lovely old trees and edged with banks of flowers. I wonder if there is buried treasure here, I thought to myself dreamily. I shouldn't be surprised if there were. Then I noticed a long pole with a large hook on the end lying on the bottom of the boat. Just the thing, I thought, dropping the hook into the water and reaching the pole down as far as I could. The hook caught something heavy and I raised it with difficulty. It was an ancient treasure chest, the wood worn from the water and the bottom covered with seaweed. There was nothing in the chest but a large black book like the spring binders used for holding manuscripts or papers together. On the spine, one word was written in gold. The word was Esculapius. The word was familiar, but I could not remember what it meant. When I looked it up, I found that it was the name of the Greek god of healing. I saw the same book once more a few nights later. This time, there was a string of pearls around it. In addition to her extraordinary dreams, Helen astonished me with detailed descriptions of places where I was staying on vacation, although she had never even seen them. She insisted one day that a friend of mine was trying to commit suicide. We telephoned him, and she was right. Thankfully, we were able to talk him out of it. As a research psychologist, Helen couldn't understand this flood of mental imagery, these uh, uh, various psychic experiences that she kept having, and it had a cumulative impact on her during the summer of 65. She kept wondering, am I losing my mind? Am I going crazy? How do I reconcile this with my role as a scientist? So her conflict certainly increased enormously during that period.
this psychic phase ended abruptly with a particularly clear picture episode in which I knew I had made an irrevocable choice. I saw myself entering a cave cut into a rock formation on a bleak, windswept sea coast. What I found in the cave was a large and very old parchment scroll. Its ends were attached to heavy gold-tipped poles, and the scroll was wrapped around them so that they met in the middle of the scroll and were tied tightly together. I managed to untie the ends and open the scroll just enough to reveal the center panel, on which two words were written, God is. Then I unrolled the scroll all the way, and as I did so, tiny letters began to appear on both sides of the panel. The silent voice, which I had heard before, explained the situation mentally to me. If you look at the left side, you will be able to read the past, said the voice. If you look at the right side, you will be able to read the future. But I hesitated only a moment before rolling up the scroll sufficiently to conceal everything except the center panel. I am not interested in reading the past or the future, I said with finality. I will just stop with this. The voice sounded both reassured and reassuring. You made it that time, it said. Thank you. And that, it seemed, was that. During part of that summer, we were both traveling, and perhaps as a means of clarifying her thoughts on emerging spiritual themes, Helen began writing a series of letters to me. Saturday. Dear Bill, I hope you will bear with this because it may be important for both of us. This morning, I kept saying, sort of without intention, I am a channel. Which seemed to mean something at the time. But the channel got clogged up. It's not open yet. Monday. Dear Bill, one evening, we were walking, and my husband, Louis, pointed out a brain-injured boy, about 12 or so, who was being pushed by his parents in a carriage. There were other disabled children there, too. As we walked, I suddenly and briefly got a sense of everyone walking happily and very much together on the same path, like on a ladder. We're not all on the same path yet, but we will all make it home eventually. Tuesday. Dear Bill. I'm not sure I want to write this, but I have an idea I'm obeying an order. These orders are rather stern, and the main feeling I get is that I wouldn't dare to disobey them. This is the second one. Helen prided herself as a research psychologist, not as someone who heard voices, who had heightened visual imagery, who experienced all of these psychic events 
that occurred throughout the summer of 65. It was extremely distressing to her. She kept feeling that maybe she was losing her mind. Certainly she couldn't reconcile all of this activity with her scientific predilections. And this became a particularly acute problem for her as the summer and early fall began. One night she called me, and uh, this was in October, and said, you know that inner voice refuses to go away. It keeps saying, this is a course in miracles. Please take notes. What shall I do? Suppose it's crazy. Suppose it doesn't make any sense. You know, suppose it's flipped. And uh, she was obviously going through a great deal of anguish and agony at that point. Well, I said the only obvious thing, why don't you take down whatever it is, you can read it to me tomorrow morning in the office, and if it doesn't make any sense, no one else ever has to know about it. But at least we'll know what it is. So that's what we did. The next morning, Helen came in, and as she read that beautiful introduction to the text, which says, nothing real can be threatened, nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. It was obvious that we were tuning in to something that could hardly be regarded as crazy, no matter how unexpected it was. This is a course in miracles. It is a required course. Only the time that you take it is voluntary. Free will does not mean that you can establish the curriculum. It means only that you can elect what you want to take at a given time. The course does not aim at teaching the meaning of love, for that is beyond what can be taught. It does aim, however, at removing the blocks to the awareness of love's presence, which is your natural inheritance. The opposite of love is fear. But what is all-encompassing can have no opposite. This course can therefore be summed up very simply in this way. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. On that first morning when Helen came up, she was in quite a state. She could hardly talk. Her voice was almost inaudible. And I kept saying to Helen, don't worry about what it says. Just read it to me, then we can look at it later. It doesn't matter. Uh, no one will have to know. We'll tear it up. We'll do whatever is necessary. But just read it to me. And it was very difficult for her to even do that. She would cough and sputter and almost have a seizure rather than being able to simply read the words calmly. Sometimes I would use one hand holding on to her <laughs> while I was trying to type with the other hand. And that extreme anxiety continued for a while, certainly during the early phases of the text when we encountered something like the first 50 principles on miracles. Miracles as such do not matter. The only thing that matters is their source, which is far beyond evaluation. Miracles occur naturally as expressions of love. The real miracle is the love that inspires them. 
In this sense, everything that comes from love is a miracle. The term miracle was one that, that bothered me at first. I think it bothered Helen too. The idea of a course in miracles seemed rather absurd. Yet when it defined a miracle as removing the barriers to our awareness of love's presence, it then began to make sense. Miracles reawaken the awareness that the spirit, not the body, is the altar of truth. This is the recognition that leads to the healing power of the miracle. Miracles are natural signs of forgiveness. Through miracles, you accept God's forgiveness by extending it to others. I realized as we continued typing up these first 50 principles with all the difficulties of getting it down and all the anxiety and so forth, that I would have to really change my mind about absolutely everything if this were true. And that seemed like a very big job. I wasn't sure I was up to it. And later I realized it's only a little willingness that is necessary. That readiness does not imply mastery, simply some willingness for change. So I recognized I had some willingness to do that. Helen was fearful, I think, of making any kind of very specific commitment about this. As a matter of fact, she said, uh, you, you're responsible for what it says. <laughs> I don't want to know exactly what it says, but if it makes any grammatical errors, if it goofs in any way, then it's had it and I will refuse to continue. A major contribution of miracles is their strength in releasing you from your false sense of isolation, deprivation, and lack. A miracle is never lost. It may touch many people you have not even met and produce undreamed of changes in situations of which you are not even aware. After I typed up whatever Helen might have dictated during a, a particular day, we would go back over the copy, checking carefully to be sure that we had all of the words exactly the way they were supposed to be. Helen at times was tempted to change a word, and then she would recognize that if she did that, it would not make sense later, so that her integrity in recording this material precisely as it came was extraordinary. She simply chose not to associate herself with it because of its high threat value at that time. She certainly did know what the material said and she did understand it. I would feel the writing coming on almost daily and sometimes several times a day. Evenings turned out to be a favorite time for dictation. I objected bitterly to this and often went to bed defiantly without writing anything. But I could not sleep. Eventually, I got up in some disgust and wrote as directed. I never knew when I started a sentence how it would end, and the ideas came so quickly that I had trouble keeping up with them. Helen could turn it on or off at any time. She could stop in the middle of a sentence without even going back to reread what she had written and continue when she had a moment. She could uh, have a research conference uh, in mid-sentence. It made no difference at all. The flow of the material continued without any altered state. Helen at no time was in a trance or anything remotely resembling a trance. You may believe that you are responsible for what you do, but not for what you think. 
the truth is that you are responsible for what you think because it is only at this level that you can exercise choice. What you do comes from what you think. Do not try to look beyond yourself for truth, for truth can only be within you. At the time the course began, I would have termed myself an agnostic. I really had no interest in formal religion, but I was also aware of the deficiencies in the psychological systems of thought with which I was familiar. And I recognized that somehow the emperor had no clothes, that there were so many of us going around expounding our various theoretical points of view, but there was no one who really knew how to put this together in a meaningful way to change the nature of our lives. You have but two emotions, love and fear. One you made and one was given you. Each is a way of seeing and different worlds arise from their different sights. See the love of God in you, and you will see it everywhere. Because it is everywhere. With love in you, you have no need except to extend it. When the course began, I began to recognize that uh, the two emotions, fear and love, which it talks about, were really the only two emotions that mattered. And that if I could learn to let go of fear, I would automatically experience love, because that is our natural reality. As I continue to practice letting go of my own defensiveness, I became aware that the Course is really about undoing. It's about forgiveness, about forgiving ourselves and others for the mistakes that we have made and not holding on to these in a way that increases our sense of guilt and unworthiness. What could you want forgiveness cannot give? Do you want peace? Forgiveness offers it. Do you want happiness? A quiet mind? A certainty of purpose? And a sense of worth and beauty that transcends the world? Do you want care and safety and the warmth of sure protection always? All of this forgiveness offers you. Forgive the world and you will understand that everything that God created cannot have an end. And nothing he did not create is real. In this one sentence is our course explained. While the course came in a form which I had never anticipated, I did regard this as the answer to my question, there must be another way and I'm determined to find it. And it seemed to me that to the extent I valued being a scientist, I should look at all the evidence before dismissing it. There was an initial reaction, can this be it? You know, is this something totally preposterous? But as I read the material, I recognized that Helen in no way could have written this material. It was totally alien to her background, to her interests, and her mode of conceptualizing abstract ideas, that uh, there's no way she could have done this. Where did the writing come from? I did not understand the calm but impressive authority with which the voice dictated. 
It is largely because of the strangely compelling nature of this authority that I have referred to the voice with a capital V. At several points in the writing, the voice itself speaks in no uncertain terms about the author, Jesus. My own reactions to these references, which literally stunned me at the time, have decreased in intensity and are now at a level of wonder and acceptance. I do re remember one occasion very keenly when Helen came in one day and she was really distraught. She was perhaps more distraught than I had seen her in some time. And this was while we were perhaps uh, somewhere in the middle of the text. And she said, this time it's really gone off the deep end. It's gibberish. It makes absolutely no sense, no meaning, nothing to it. It's absolutely impossible. I refuse to read it to you, and so forth. After I had calmed her down, why she did agree to read the material to me. And I might quote the very end of that section. Forgive us our illusions, Father, and help us to accept our true relationship with you, in which there are no illusions and where none can ever enter. Our holiness is yours. What can there be in us that needs forgiveness when yours is perfect? The sleep of forgetfulness is only our unwillingness to accept your forgiveness and your love. Let us not wander into temptation, for the temptation of the Son of God is not your will. And let us receive only what you have given and accept but this into the minds which you created and which you love. Amen. At that point, Helen burst into tears. The beauty of the language, the profundity of the thought, and the, in a sense, the equivalence of the Lord's Prayer for the Course seemed to be so clear that this was a statement in the Course very similar to the Lord's Prayer in many of its dimensions. And it made a very profound impact on Helen, as well as, of course, on me. Every once in a while, I mean, the frustration would reach the point that one or both would say in unison, why me or why us? I mean, uh, what did we do to deserve this? <laughs> and, uh, but that passed, that passed. Uh, the, the import and the content of the course was, was making a great impression upon, it, uh, upon them. Um, and uh, the responsibility of the task was very important. And uh, if anything, I think it increased over, over the years. I think they reached a point of, of at least some accommodation to it and some sense of, of comfort simply out of the organization that they developed in handling the task of transcription in an orderly way. I attribute this largely to, to Bill. And it was necessary to sustain Helen with this framework, the discipline of this framework. As the material developed, of course, a great deal of it became increasingly beautiful. Hundreds of pages are in iambic pentameter, Shakespearean blank verse. And uh, when we discovered that, it was almost as if we were being given words and music at the same time. Let us be still an instant and forget all things we ever learned all thoughts we had, and every preconception that we hold of what things mean and what their purpose is. Let us remember not our own ideas of what the world is for. We do not know. Let every image held by everyone be loosened from our minds and swept away. Be innocent of judgment unaware of any thoughts of evil or of good that ever crossed your mind of anyone. 
Now do you know him not, but you are free to learn of him, and learn of him anew. Now is he born again to you, and you are born again to him, without the past that sentenced him to die, and you with him. Now is he free to live, as you are free, because an ancient learning passed away and left a place for truth to be reborn. The first part of the material that we worked on lasted for almost three years and uh, ended up as a 622-page volume. We didn't know when we started what A Course in Miracles was going to be. We didn't know whether it might be a few pages, you know, what whatever it was, we had no idea. But Helen did ask at one point, how will I know when this is over? And she was told, you will hear the word Amen. And that occurs at the very end of the text where it says, and now we say Amen. I mean, there were times when they both felt uh, pressured, tired, exhausted, uh, or Helen was ill with the cold or a sinus infection. And nonetheless, that didn't make any difference as far as the course was concerned. The material still came through. When the text was finished, Helen felt, as I did, that that was the completion of our assignment and that we had plenty to do to simply try to learn those concepts and apply them in our lives. However, after a period of perhaps nine months, Helen got increasingly restless. Then one day, she began to take down the workbook for students, which consists of 365 lessons, one for each day of the year. And that was the beginning of the second part of the course. That took approximately two and a half years. And at the end of that, we again thought that we were finished. And after a number of months, again, of not being quite sure what would happen next, the third and final volume was announced as the manual for teachers. So the total period of time was approximately seven years from the time we began with the text, including the workbook, and finally the manual for teachers. The journey to God is merely the reawakening of the knowledge of where you are always and what you are forever. It is a journey without distance to a goal that has never changed. You dwell not here, but in eternity. You travel but in dreams, while safe at home. By the fall of 1972, Helen and I had completed the Course in Miracles, with the exception of a clarification of terms section which we added later. At that time, I decided to make about 12 Xerox copies of the course, keeping them, of course, hidden and secret, and available for those few people who might wander into our lives and really be interested and prepared for this material. I had no idea who they might be, and I certainly suspected that the number would be very small. Anyway, I had shared this with one of my graduate students, a Father Michael, and uh, in the course of talking with him about his interests in spirituality and mysticism and so forth, we discovered that there was a psychologist named Kenneth Wapnick who was working in one of the New York State hospitals. And Ken Wapnick had done a doctoral dissertation on St. Teresa and schizophrenia. Now this seemed like a very strange topic for anyone in psychology to be working on, so I was quite intrigued. And Helen and I 
actually met Ken in November of 1972, just before he was scheduled to make a trip to Israel. And when I did return to the States in the May of 1973, I made a beeline for Helen and Bill's office at Columbia Presbyterian. And that was when I saw The Course in Miracles for the first time. And what they did is that Bill sat me in his office. He went into Helen's office, which was immediately adjacent to it. And Helen gave me her two most favorite sections of the text are the section for they have come in chapter 26, which I think is one of the most beautiful uh, parts of the whole course. And then the final section of the text, choose once again. And both of those, those sections almost literally knocked me off my feet. It was the most beautiful thing that I'd ever read uh, that in addition said something. Trials are but lessons that you failed to learn, presented once again. So where you made a faulty choice before, you now can make a better one, and thus escape all pain that what you chose before has brought to you. In every difficulty, all distress and each perplexity, Christ calls to you and gently says, my brother, choose again. Shortly after that, when I began reading the course from cover to cover, it became clear to me that my, that my destiny was not to return to Israel and live in the monastery, which is what I thought at that point, but that I should spend the rest of my time with Helen and Bill in New York City, and that, that indeed is what we did. What was remarkable was that there were virtually no changes in, the, in the, the actual text of all the course. Um, the, the, the major editing was involved only in chapter designation and the physical organization of the printed work. But the manuscripts were remarkable in their order and clarity, directly, uh, just as Helen translated it from her shorthand notes. This was the manuscript that I had seen some of the titles I felt were not really appropriate to the, the section. The capitalization was inconsistent, the paragraphing was inconsistent, the punctuation was inconsistent, etc. So I discussed this with Helen and Bill and saying that I really felt it should be gone through one more time just to be sure that it was exactly the way it was supposed to be. So Helen and I began this somewhere in the late fall of 1973, going through the, the entire manuscript line by line, word by word. Uh, this took about a year. At that point, I think that the manuscript was basically uh, some 1,500 pages. This was a huge job, as you can imagine. I, it made Helen very, very anxious to have to go back over all this material so that a lot of time had to be spent in coaxing her to do this. But she did recognize that this was a very, very important project. Uh, we discussed with Bill anything that we did in terms of any changes that we might have made. And, and we always felt that, that Jesus was really helping us do this. Uh, that, that anything that we were doing was really done with his guidance and his blessing. The name of Jesus Christ as such is but a symbol, but it stands for love that is not of this world. This course comes from him because his words have reached you in a language you can love and understand. The name of Jesus is the name of one who was a man, but saw the face of Christ in all his brothers and remembered God. Is he the Christ? Oh, yes, along with you. One of the things that I was most impressed with about the Course was the fact that Jesus was the author of it. I just could not believe that anybody else could have written it. It was very clear to me that Helen couldn't have written it, and I couldn't imagine it having any other source but Jesus himself. When the course started coming through Helen, she felt extremely uncomfortable in sharing this with her husband, Louis. This was mainly because the course was so Christian in its statement 
and because Louis was such an identified Jew. It was clear that he would find the content of the course very difficult, not to mention the process of the writing itself. So Helen did explain to him what was happening, but omitting the fact that Jesus was the voice that she was hearing. Helen also shared some of the material with him, but carefully choosing those parts of the course that did not contain specific Christian language. Louis' response was that he was interested, that he was fascinated by what his wife was doing, and his own way was encouraging in terms of her completing this task. It was also clear to us that this course was not just given to Helen and Bill, uh, or to me or a few other people, but was really meant for the world. But this wasn't something we felt was our, our job as such. So that we did feel some kind of pressure to get the manuscript finished, retyped, and then we would just wait. Helen was not comfortable with the problems of, of what to do with the material, how to get it published, how to uh, disseminate it. And also she was extremely concerned, uh, as was Bill, with what effect the knowledge of this course and its, and its dissemination would have upon their professional lives because um, they were eminent um, people professionally and uh, uh, one professionally, one in their field, uh, did not involve, get, become involved in metaphysical works of this type. It was really too uh, radical. Helen was due for retirement from the medical center the end of June in 1975. I had already been able to, to extend her tenure for almost a year, but at this point she would have to resign her professorship because of age. I had been quite concerned during this period that somehow the course be in other hands than ours. It seemed to me that the course was waiting for a home and I wasn't quite sure where that home was going to be or how we would find it. I was teaching at New York University in 1975 and feeling full up with an exciting career in what we then called experimental parapsychology or consciousness research, meeting very interesting people, traveling, speaking, and I was feeling a sort of emptiness. I didn't know why. Being full up, one should think that one would really be happy. I found myself quickly sinking into a sense of self-loathing and also a quandary of desperation. I didn't know where to turn. I felt bereft. One night, I locked myself in the bathroom in my home, and I went to pieces. I could say it was a form of surrender. I called out from the bottom of my heart, won't someone up there please help me? And I meant it. Within a very short time, I received the help I sought, but not in the form I anticipated. A few days after, I was asked by a good friend to accompany him to meet two professors of medical psychology at Columbia University School of Physicians and Surgeons. I went with him, not knowing what to expect or why the meeting, but it seemed as if I was supposed to go. And that kind of mood continued as Bill took us inside the university where we had lunch with Bill and his associate, Helen Shuckman. I found her to be a very clever woman, very intellectual and well-spoken, quite articulate and a bit sharp, and I was intimidated. And the conversation was going in all different directions. And a little bit bemused, I found myself turning to Helen and saying to her, you're hearing an inner voice, aren't you? And I didn't really know what I meant. But she seemed quite startled. And she said, I beg your pardon. And Bill tried to soothe the situation. He said, oh, well, Helen, let's go back to our office and let's talk about this in private. And the two of them took me back to their office and closed the door, and there we met for the first time, Kenneth Wapnick. We all sat together as Helen and Bill told us the story of their last 10 years and the scribing of A Course in Miracles. I listened to the story intently, and I was there a few hours, and they had lots to tell me, and I had questions. And finally, I was anxious to see this document called A Course in Miracles in its black binder, 
that Helen had predicted in a vision. And Helen seemed a little bit startled at that point. It was one thing telling me the story. It was something else showing it to me. But Bill opened the filing cabinet, and he told Helen that she's going to see it sooner or later. It might as well be now. And he handed her the book. And there were actually seven volumes, but I could only see one at a time. So she handed me the text with its introduction. And I took it from her, and I put it on my lap, as the others were talking among themselves. And I looked down at it. I opened up the black binder, and I turned to the introduction. And I read, this is a course in miracles. It's a required course. And there was no question in my mind that I was being given a miracle and that I had asked for it. Tolerance for pain may be high, but it is not without limit. Eventually, everyone begins to recognize, however dimly, that there must be a better way. As this recognition becomes more firmly established, it becomes a turning point. This ultimately reawakens spiritual vision. Helen and Ken and I frequently met at Judy's apartment at the Beresford on Central Park West. This was an opportunity for us to gather together, meet people who were interested in metaphysical ideas, uh, particularly people who were interested in the course, since Judy had managed to disseminate the course in Xerox form very quickly to a large number of her friends. And I had this tremendous sense of relief that I could release those 12 copies that I'd been hiding in the closet and that Judy had taken the ball and was running with it that she was doing the things that were needed at that point to disseminate the material, to begin to get critical reactions from people, and in a sense to socialize us to what was going on in the larger world outside of academia, where we have been confined for so many years. We met a large number of very eminent people in California, as well as in New York, who were serious students of the course. All of them wanted additional copies. Everyone was dissatisfied with the fact that this was available only by rapidly Xeroxing hundreds and hundreds of pages of material. So it became apparent in the course of this that we were going to have to entertain the idea of publication. At that point, several people did come up made offers uh, to publish the, the course in its entirety, but none of this seemed exactly right. One wanted to shorten it. Another one wanted to edit it severely. Another one wanted to remove the Christian terminology. Distortions here, distortions there, and it didn't feel right. We really had a sense that this document was to stay intact as Helen took it down with no changes. There didn't seem to be anyone at all who wanted to do it just that way. And we resorted to a technique that we still use very actively in our lives of asking together when we had a problem mutually that we wanted to solve. We would sit around, discuss the problem, and then close our eyes and phrase a question internally and wait for a feeling, a phrase, an answer in some form that we felt was accurate. We implored the Holy Spirit within to give us guidance. The guidance we got was that the material was supposed to be published and soon, and that indeed it was to be disseminated, and also that it was to be kept intact. We were told through asking through our inner selves that only those who were to do this and only this, the rest of their lives, should be involved, and that they would be caretakers of the information. We wondered who that possibly could be, and we looked around the room and realized <laughs> there we were. But where was the money to come from? And that was the question. That was one thing we didn't have. <laughs> we sat in quiet 
And I remember even the date that that happened. It was Valentine's Day, February 14th, 1976. Because as we sat quietly, internalizing, asking the Holy Spirit, the voice for God, to direct us and to tell us the answer to that question, I heard something so clearly that I couldn't deny it. And the answer was, make the commitment first. I knew it had to be true. So we did. We said, we will. We went to sleep that night. I woke up in the morning thinking I was a bit daft. The telephone rang. And there at the other end of the line, calling me from Mazatlan, Mexico, was a man I'd only met once. His name was Reed Erickson. He said to me, I'm studying the manuscript called A Course in Miracles, given to me by your friend, Zelda Suplee. And I am so delighted with a thought system that I can truly follow, that I have been working with a group here in Mexico, studying it. And I told him I was very glad to hear that, and we chatted a bit. And he said, but you know, the form in which it is now is very unwieldy. You have to have it published in hard-covered books. And I told him, well, that is very synchronistic. That's exactly what we were speaking of. And I, I related to him how we had been sitting and asking for guidance on this. So I said, we're ready to go, but really, Eric, I have no idea where the funds are to come from. He said, well, that's the reason I'm calling you. I was interdirected to sell a piece of land only last week, and your foundation has all the money it needs to publish 5,000 hard-covered copies of A Course in Miracles. Do it immediately. Beyond the body, beyond the sun and stars, past everything you see and yet somehow familiar, is an arc of golden light that stretches as you look into a great and shining circle. And all the circle fills with light before your eyes. The edges of the circle disappear, and what is in it is no longer contained at all. The light expands and covers everything, extending to infinity, forever shining and with no break or limit anywhere. Within it, everything is joined in perfect continuity. Nor is it possible to imagine that anything could be outside. For there is nowhere that this light is not. What is a miracle but this remembering? And who is there in whom this memory lies not? The light in one awakens it in all. And when you see it in your brother, you are remembering for everyone. In 1958, I accepted an appointment as professor of medical psychology at Columbia University's College of Physicians and Surgeons. One of my first duties after I arrived was to hire a research psychologist, Dr. Helen Shuckman, for a major research project in our department. Helen and I 
work together very closely over the next seven years on a wide variety of professional, administrative, and clinical problems. And while for the most part our work was, I would say, well done, there was also a sense of frustration and conflict in our personal and professional relationships. One day I felt I had had it, and I said to Helen unexpectedly, there must be another and better way of working in this world, and I'm determined to find it. To my great surprise, Helen said, you're absolutely right, Bill. We'll find it together. This collaboration served as a trigger for Helen to hear an inner voice, which dictated an extraordinary answer to our search for a better way. It came as a 1,500-page self-study course in spiritual development. It was called A Course in Miracles and was channeled through Helen for the seven years between 1965 and 1972. Listen. Perhaps you catch a hint of an ancient state not quite forgotten. Dim, perhaps, and yet not altogether unfamiliar. Like a song whose name is long forgotten and the circumstances in which you heard completely unremembered. Listen. Not the whole song has stayed with you, but just a little wisp of melody attached not to a person or a place or anything particular, but you remember from just this little part how lovely was the song, how wonderful the setting where you heard it, and how you loved those who were there and listened with you. Listen. One of my favorite quotations from the Course is, two minds with one intent become so strong that what they will becomes the will of God. A Course in Miracles became published very quickly, and it was actually ready on June 22, 1976. There were hundreds of people who had written in to ask about it, and we had no trouble distributing the first printing. In fact, our, again, inner guidance had very carefully instructed us that as a not-for-profit foundation holding the copyright of A Course in Miracles, we were not to conventionally advertise it, that people would hear about it in a low-keyed way, word of mouth, and that the best way to disseminate the course would be to let people demonstrate it. And that became our policy and our philosophy, which we still keep to this day. It has been quite amazing to me to see how the course travels with wings <laughs> by itself. I read one page. And in that one page of reading it, I heard for the first time in a little inner voice that said, physician, heal thyself. This is your way home. And I had the most amazing experience of, of feeling a sense of oneness with the whole world, that there was absolutely no separation, that there was only love, and a real feeling that I was to be of service to God. My whole life would be changed, and it would be a life of giving and, and, and a life of being of service. I really couldn't understand that, but it was a very deep, uh, penetrating uh, feeling. And I became a student of the Course, fought it all the way, couldn't deal with the thickness of the Course, let alone its Christian terminology. And yet there was something about the Course that just compelled me to go on. I encountered A Course in Miracles at a very critical time in my life when I was chief of the Foreign Affairs and National Defense Division of the Library of Congress and had 150 professional men and women working for me and for the Congress to clarify major issues of defense policy and foreign policy. And 
it was a very rich and full life, a very useful career, you might say, as far as informing Congress about uh, different ways of looking at foreign and defense pol uh, policy issues. But unfortunately, at precisely the time when, from an outsider's perception of me, my life seemed to be most useful, it had the least meaning. I found it uh, very threatening to incorporate uh, these principles into my practice. Uh, first of all, I was concerned in those days about what other people might think of me. I didn't want someone to think I was a uh, God freak or a Jesus freak. So I really didn't tell anybody what I was doing and wanted to keep that uh, very quiet, uh, very much uh, to myself. And it took, uh, I think, several months before I even uh, shared uh, this with people who were close to me, like my brothers. Uh, and my children. Uh, I kept it that, uh, that secret. Several quotations became my, my guide, and I guess, in a sense, the one that was most startling for me was the quotation, do not seek to change the world, instead change your mind about it. Now, given the fact that my entire professional life had been dedicated to leaving the world a better place, in effect to changing some of the things that I thought were wrong with the world. And my technique for doing that was to try to understand economics, politics, strategy, psychology, sociology, uh, the Chinese language. I, I had a great deal of education that aimed at being more useful. And yet as time went on, I became very clear that, as they say in Washington, where I stand on an issue depends on where I sit. So when I read this first quote in the course, it was something that, as people say in California, really resonated with me. It sounded true. My interest in the Course in Miracles began some years ago when I was doing research at the University of California on meditation and different schools of religion. And someone showed me a copy of the course, and I reacted with great skepticism and uh, refused to look at it for a couple of years. Until when I finally did, I was quite surprised and, and surprisingly impressed, particularly by two things. One was that I found there was a, a psychological system within it which was very sophisticated and on a par in many ways with some contemporary thinking in Western psychology. And the second thing that surprised and impressed me was that it became clear that this seemed to represent an example of the underlying perennial wisdom which seems to lie at the core of the world's great religions. I believe that we in the modern Western Christian church need to modernize our beloved yet now ancient Christian theology because modern Christian theology is more a reflection of the opinions of Paul the Apostle and ancient Jewish theology than it is a reflection of the teachings of Jesus. In addition, 2,000 years of use and abuse have rendered the teachings of Jesus distorted. The improvement that I am suggesting brings us up out of the theological dark ages where God was seen as a killer. It reestablishes God's good name. It encourages us to play in his presence. In the Course of Miracles, it teaches that God is accessible at all times, in all places, to everyone unconditionally and everyone equally. God is available in our mind, in all places, at all moments, without restriction of any description. In its teaching, God is the guru, God is the teacher, God is the altar, God is the church, the synagogue, and the temple. God is everything, including the theology. God is the way, the truth, and the life. When I first read in A Course in Miracles, the ideas that our home is in God's presence, that we are spirit and not the body, that we have been created as one with each other and our source. I just knew it was true. I'd had the experience. I didn't need validation of the experience.
to know it was true, but I did need an intellectual system to help me apply it. And that's what I first noticed about the course, that I could start with a lesson a day to start to unlearn the mistakes that had been programmed into my mind, that I could remember more clearly that indeed I am spirit. And in that sense, I'm at home and totally safe. I don't have to go any place to find safety. I don't have to be anyone different. I just have to remember who I am. Growing up in Louisiana, I really was never aware of any inequality. I came from a very large family. My mother and father basically worked for themselves. And very loving sisters took care of me. I really had no idea that some people really felt that they were better than others or more than others. I um, came to UC Berkeley around 1967. It's very turbulent years at, at the school, a lot of racial strife. And around 1968, um, 69, I took a lot of courses, a lot of courses in sociology, psychology, political science. And every the theme in all of them was blacks were poor, blacks were deprived, blacks were, you know, the wretched of society. I, I began to look at life, the society, with, with anger and frustration. And around that same time, there was a group of people who called themselves the Nation of Islam. And it basically taught black, black supremacy. And I, li I lived this doctrine. I ate it. I slept it. I didn't really socialize with whites for seven years. I never would go into their stores. We made our own clothes. We cooked, grew our food. Everything we did, I lived, ate, slept Islam. And one Sunday, I was looking for an apartment. And I was thumbing through the paper. And I saw a set of lectures at uh, JFK in Arenda, University of JFK in Arenda. And something said, you need to go because Ann Armstrong is going to be there. And Ann Armstrong was this psychic. And I was really feeling like, well, I'm, I probably should get another perception of what's really going on in the world, what's really going on for me, because I was feeling the pull to look at uh, things differently. So I went over to JFK and I was like, you know, this is the very first, I, haven't, I hadn't been on the campus or in a, a white environment for seven years. And when I got there, she wasn't there. It was a lady there named Judy Scutch and she was introducing a set of books titled A Course in Miracles. And she was reading the introduction. And something happened inside of me that was very different. Very, very different. Because I, as I, I remember, I, was, I had gone into the lecture hall. The room was filled with Caucasians, whites. And I felt very, very self-conscious. You know, what am I doing in this large auditorium with all of these whites? So I moved down to the front row and put my head down and folded my arms. and was really on guard, you know, and very paranoid, and very, you know, kind of somewhat, very, some, a little, somewhat frightened, but feeling like I had to be there for some reason. I didn't know why, as, especially as I knew that Ann Armstrong wasn't going to be there. And when Judy read this introduction, I had this experience that I hadn't experienced since I was a child, that I was one with everything in the room. I felt totally at peace. And something deep inside of me said, this is a tool for you. Use it. One of the concerns that a number of people have is how can we distinguish something like the Course in Miracles, which seems to be a genuine, transcendental, spiritual practice, from some of the much less sophisticated and sometimes dangerous groups that are around, including some of the cults that are, are so prevalent now. And it's interesting that recent research suggests a couple of ways in which we can distinguish among these different groups, and that the Course in Miracles seems to fit all the criteria for meeting, for being a genuine spiritual discipline. The first is that it has no guru, 
and that uh, people who practice it are thrown back on their own responsibility. They're told that ultimately the decisions have to be their own to make through, through accessing their own inner wisdom. So the source of wisdom, the source of authority is within rather than given to someone outside. Nothing outside change, but what's inside begin to change. I begin to see the love that was there between, from human to human. I began to experience that. I began to get new friends who were not, look, that didn't just look like me, who were white, you know, who were Hispanic or, you know, color became, did not, was not an issue in my relationships. I began to see that all men are created equal. And unless we see that, we're not going to experience peace. I begin to see that um, anytime I see myself as being above another human being or below a hum uh, another human being, I'm not going to experience peace. The Course is predicated on two belief systems. One is real, the other is false. The false belief system is one the ego adheres to, and that is that we're born into this world in physical bodies in a world that is real, the physical, and things happen to us, and sometimes we experience happiness, once in a while joy, very often depression and anxiety, certainly disease, and always death. And that's the system of thought that the ego loves, the ego adheres to, the ego exalts, and the ego wants us to believe in. On the other hand, there's the belief system that God is our reality, we are created in God's image as spirit, not the physical body, that we are love, that a property of love is light, and that we are eternal. We cannot be hurt. We're inviolate. We can't be destroyed. When one puts it that way, who but an insane person would want to choose the ego? This is a very exciting time because there are several things now happening which are enabling us to, rep to recognize the common core at the center of the world's religions in ways which we couldn't do a few years ago. Firstly, we have the world's religions available to us for the first time, so that's one exciting thing. The second is that we also have some new texts available from early Christian times which paint a very different picture of early Christianity and suggest that it was actually much more mystically based than we have be, we previously thought, and that some of its early teachings are quite consistent with some of the Eastern traditions. And given these facts, then the Course in Miracles seems to be consistent with some of the early Christian thinking. The third thing we have is a more sophisticated Western psychology now which due to its insights into, for example, the nature of states of consciousness, has enabled us to get a new understanding of the nature of religion. And for the first time in history, we can understand that religions at their core, the world's religions contain roadmaps for training the mind to induce transcendental states of consciousness. The transcendental states of consciousness from which they probably or originally sprang. And the Course seems to represent a contemporary Christian example of this perennial wisdom or perennial philosophy as it's been called. I would say that not only is, is the Course the most important book since the Bible, I think it's probably one of the most important books throughout uh, the whole whole period of civilization. I think that it certainly purifies the Bible of a lot of its uh, misconceptions and distortions. And I would see the, the Course really as being on a par with some, some of the great ancient texts, like uh, the, the Upanishads or the Vedas or the I Ching, in a kind of a, a metaphysical purity of seeing uh, the world as being, uh, being an illusion and yet also uh, deals with, with how we should live in this world. I have the greatest esteem for Dr. Wapnick and others, some of my close friends, and I um, reverence and esteem them personally. I would just like to get clarity on what's really going on and that we don't mislead people thinking this is really Christianity, but just with a slight little touch of difference. It's something radically different, which is fine as long as you know it's different. The Course claims to be a correction of Orthodox theology and Christianity, and I believe that it is. 
one of the major corrections is the belief that humans and God are separated. It obviously appears that we are. That is, it, it's like we can't see God here. We can't feel God. It appears that we have been stuck on earth uh, against our will, that we are prisoners in these bodies, and we have no real way of connecting with God. The essence of God, according to the Course of Miracles, is that God is pure spirit. And some of the characteristics of spirit is that it is perfect, it is limitless, it is infinite, and it is eternal. This also must mean that anything that comes from God, that God creates, must also share in those same characteristics or attributes. So that according to the Course in Miracles, Christ, who is defined as God's one Son, or the creation or the extension of God, must also share in these same attributes. So that Christ, too, must be pure spirit. He must be without form, must be infinite, perfect, and eternal. Since our true identity, as the Course teaches us, is Christ, is this pure essence of spirit, then this means that anything that is other than, than spirit, anything of the ego or of the body, must therefore not be of God, which then means that it does not exist. The first thing that I find incompatible with any form of Orthodox Christianity, or Judaism too, is the doctrine of creation. That is to say, the traditional Christian doctrine is that God made the material world, God made it himself, and that it was very good. In the Old Testament it says, you know, after the first day's work and so on, God saw what he had made and that it was good, very good. Now, in the, the Course in Miracles, uh, declares that God did not create the material universe. It is the result of a splitting off of a part of the divine consciousness into an ego which separated from God and that it's a kind of illusion. It is not the work of God as creator. So God is the first article of the creed in the Christian creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, is denied because God is not that and God the Father doesn't even know about this material world. The Course teaches that when we separated from, from God, which was still in our mind, the world of matter or form still had not uh, come into existence. Uh, in order to escape from God's wrath, what we did was that we uh, ran out of our mind, as it were, projected that thought of separation, and, and that projection then became the world. So that the the world then is really seen as a, a, a large smoke screen, a hiding place in which we seek to conceal ourselves so God won't punish us. The second point of incompatibility I'd like to bring out with regard to Jesus is um, the fact that in the traditional Christian doctrine, Jesus is the eternal Son of God who then becomes man, takes on a real body and real flesh, as St. John puts it, and then is a redeemer by dying on the cross to forgive our sins. It's been a, a hallmark of Christian thinking ever since the time of, of the first Gospels that Jesus was the only Son of God. And then, as St. Paul had said once, we're, we're the adopted sons. So in a sense, we become second-class citizens. Uh, and what the Course very strongly teaches is that Jesus, again, is not the only Son. We are all part of the same Sonship. That the only difference between ourselves and Jesus is that he was the first one to get through. You know, he got smarter faster than anybody else so that uh, he then becomes like an older brother who reaches back to help everybody else do what he did. Also, as part of this doctrine, the traditional Christian doctrine of the resurrection, where Christ has risen from the dead with a real body, and then will become, that has now become his glorified body forever, and all of us are called also to a resurrection of a real body, which will be part of our further happiness in heaven. Now, in the Course in Miracles, that, of course, can't be true. Jesus can't be risen in his real body because there is no real body. The body is an illusion. So he's returning to his pure spiritual state and nature. There's a whole section in the Course at the beginning of chapter 6 where Jesus specifically talks about his crucifixion. And he says that in the eyes of the world, I was beaten, abandoned, torn, and finally killed. But then, as he says, this was not a perception that I shared for myself. He did not see a sinful world attacking him. He saw a fearful world uh, crucifying him, believing that by getting him out of the way, then their own sins would be safe. And what Jesus says in several places in the text is he says, take me 
act as your model for learning. That when we're tempted to see ourselves as being crucified by the world and as being victimized by the world, and most of the time under circumstances far less extreme than occurred with him, then we should remember what he did. Not that he was crucified and killed, but that rather that he did not share the perception that the world had, and that we should ask his help that we look at the situation that is troubling us through the same eyes that he did. And again, that's what he means when he says, take me as your model. He also says in the text, teach not that I died in vain, teach rather that I did not die by demonstrating that I live in you. And the way that we demonstrate that he lives in us is not by standing up on a soapbox preaching, or ramming the Bible or the Course down anybody's throat, but rather by demonstrating that the same principles of forgiveness that he lived by are the same principles we live by. And above all, to deny the temptation to our see, see ourselves unfairly treated by the world. And that really is what the message of the crucifixion is. A third point would be the doctrine of the Eucharist itself. Christians, especially Catholics, believe that the Eucharist is the real body and blood of Christ, which they receive, as a nourishment and a uh, spiritual, um, a spiritual nourishment and uh, a sacrament. Now, in the course of miracles, that of course can't be true, because there is no real body of Christ. It it has to be an illusion, and not the real nature of Christ. When I opened the text for the first time, I felt the presence of Jesus very strongly right by me, as I was reading the opening pages of the of the text. And uh, then I came across a statement that absolutely blew my mind, and that was that God did not create the world. At that point, it was like Eureka. Everything fell into place. Uh, all my grievances against God uh, just vanished, because I said, why didn't I even think of this? I mean, it's so simple. He didn't create this. Uh, we made this mess, and I've been blaming him all these years and holding this against him. And uh, for me, that changed the rest of my life. Nothing was ever the same again. I think the concept in the Course, which gives most of us a lot of difficulty, and certainly was my most difficult concept, was the one about this world being totally illusory. And I think all of us have preferences for our illusions. We like to think that there are more beautiful illusions, more spiritual illusions, and then there, there are illusions at the bottom, which are, you know, the pits. And the Course is quite clear that this is all illusion. When I apply this in situations where things are not really going well, it's quite easy to say, oh, this is a terrible mess, but this is all illusion anyway, so it really doesn't make any difference. On the other hand, on a practical day-to-day -day basis where one has to cope with human psychology and living in this world, I find that it's helpful not to be terribly hard on myself in looking at my humanness. And the Course also speaks very fully about this in the teacher's manual where it cautions us not to despair because of our limitations, because it says while it is our function to escape limitations, they will always be with us, because if we are to be heard by those who suffer, we must speak their language. If we are to be a savior, we must understand what we must escape from. And so not to be too concerned about goals for which we are not yet ready to ask the important questions and to ask for help when we need it and to sit silently knowing that we will receive the answers as much as we are able to accept them at the time for our level. So I think it's very important to be aware of our humanness and to know that the Course acknowledges that and that we are not in these bodies because we are totally perfect, but we are in these bodies because we have lessons to learn. Once you accept his plan as the one function that you would fulfill, there will be nothing else the Holy Spirit will not arrange for you without your effort. He will go before you making straight your path and leaving in your way no stones to trip on and no obstacles to bar your way. Nothing you need will be denied you. Not one seeming difficulty but will melt away before you reach it. You need, you need take thought for nothing careless of everything except the only purpose you would fulfill. As that was given you, so will its fulfillment be." Um, this, this is an amazing promise. <laughs> um, I found that uh, after a while I wanted to rephrase the Course for myself, 
And so I took passages like this, and the most meaningful affirmation uh, for me came to be one that I would recite as I went down the freeway or any other odd time in, uh, in, in my uh, daily life. But I have no other desire, no other ambition, no goal, no nothing. I have no other desire than to know the deepest part of myself and to follow that. And then this kind of statement says, if you do that, everything will be all right. Whatever you need, it will show up, coincidentally, accidentally, whatever. Uh, if you want to know what should I be doing, uh, what am I here for, what's really meaningful, it, it shows up. <laughs> when we say hear or listen to the voice inside, it's just a catchphrase to encompass so many different kinds of feeling. Sometimes I've had the experience of actually hearing, as if there was a voice, say, about over here. But that's been very rare, only three or four times in my life that I could remember. And then it was quite dramatic. I whirled around. I thought someone else was in the room answering a question I had just voiced. But most of the time, when I listen, the kind of hearing is a feeling. It's words, but the words feel right. They promise joining. They promise an all-win solution. They promise that which is peaceful. They promise love. When I'm not listening to my higher voice, I'm listening to the ego. We're always listening. We know that feeling of dialoguing back and forth. Should I do this? No, I shouldn't. Should I do that? Yes, I should. When I'm listening to the smaller voice, it usually isn't peaceful. Most of the time, it's self-serving. Always is a tinge of fear, and it's never all win. I've become very familiar with that voice. In fact, I can say that I know it intimately as both my own and the higher. And sometimes I won't actually feel, hear, see words, but a book will be handed to me that explains the solution to a problem. I'll experience music that suddenly helps a mood change. Someone will call on the telephone with a piece of information or some advice that I needed and wanted, and I know that those are answers, too. There's a line in the course I absolutely love. It says, show the slightest willingness, and a thousand angels rush in to help. And the angels are not just unseen. They're all around us in many sizes and shapes, and they're each other. Two of my favorite quotes from the Course are two lessons. Number 134, which is, if I defend myself, I am attacked. And the other is 185, or 285, which is, uh, my mind can change all thoughts that hurt. Um, these I have found of tremendous practical value in going through life. And uh, I've also found that in dealing with other people, and especially when we go into the prisons and deal with people who are in prison, that these two lessons are very pragmatic, very practical, and are of tremendous value to those people who have found themselves in that situation. In 1969, I was involved in uh, several crimes which brought me to San Quentin, which became my home for 15 years uh, plus, and the crimes were murder, kidnap, two armed robberies, and eventually a burglary, a uh, violation of a probation that I'd previously had. Uh, my youth was kind of uh, spent on the streets as a wild and rambunctious, bravado, scared asshole. My way of uh, getting attention, as it turned out, was to get involved in crime. I had a kind of a Exemplary life on one side in that I was doing dancing. I was a professional dancer for 11 and a half years. And uh, that was the side that my parents and my family knew. And then the other side that my peers knew was that I was kind of a devilish Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, uh, running around late at night and committing burglaries and doing drugs and drinking and cavorting around with the so-called bad crowds. When I reached my 21st birthday, I was just a cauldron pot ready to explode, and consequently, that's what happened. It was I like exploded. There's a group out here in, in Marin County uh, that goes into San Quentin Prison every Wednesday night into the minimum security part of the prison. 
and there's a group that goes in now to the maximum security part every Thursday night. Uh, in dealing with these people for the last two years, uh, I have seen tremendous change in some of these people who are in prison. Obviously not all of them, but some of them. The court started getting, letting me get peace, uh, letting me relax, and I started experimenting uh, with the lessons that I was picking up and trying them out on people, uh, and I started getting real warmth and closeness and uh, in touch with people. Uh, when they hurt, I hurt. Not out of uh, sympathy, but out of empathy, I could understand more clearly. Having experienced the pain and the, the, the degradations and the, the things that go on in prison. And uh, not pointing fingers at that's their fault. You know, they did that to me. Society did that to me. Uh, the uh, jury did that to me. Uh, the judge did that to me. I, I was real clear now that, you know, I did that to me. Uh, I allowed myself to become uh, unconnected. I allowed myself to be uh, unloving and unavailable and resentful and bitter and things like that. Once I got that, then it was real clear that uh, it was okay to tell somebody that, you know what, uh, I love you, and, and be in prison at the same time. I like to say that, you know, personally, that it gives me peace of mind when I don't worry about other things that go on around me, and I try not to make no judgment as to what what somebody else does or nothing. You know, even what somebody else says, I don't even make no personal judgment of it. I used to, because it used to affect me. Why you say, well, that person is wrong, or this, you know, he made a bad judgment. Right now, I don't even, you know, even really care. Whatever they do is their business, and you know, whatever they say is their business. And I, I try to just shut my ears out to what I don't want to hear. And what, don't, what I don't want to affect me, if I feel it's going to affect me, I just shut my ears out to it and I say, it's none of my business. And just wham, bam, and just keep my own inner peace just like that. Rather than turn them off, which I used to do, now I try to listen to them and try to help them out. Because whatever I put out is going to come back. If I help him out, I can help me out and I'll be better in handling their problem later. Meanwhile, at that time, there will be something <coughs> constructive going on. For instance, I say, hey, you may be right, he's, he's cussing me out for something he said that I do. I say, you may be right, let me think about that. That takes the onus off, that takes a little bit of the pressure off so this guy can cool off a little bit. Or I'll find some other, I'm just using that for example. But it's important that I try to help him out. I put myself in that frame of looking right at him because he was who I was actually mad at and uh, said to my and repeated it over and over to myself that I I could have peace and I could give myself peace in the situation and uh, I, I felt a lot more relaxed I really did and uh, it brought I, I don't feel as mad as I did before I'll put it that way and I feel I feel a little different. I still have a little bit of hostility in me, but I still have to uh, work with it more, you know? Uh, I'm new to it. Uh, he just had me so uptight. What the course does for a lot of people is to get them to know, recognize, almost instantly, that they are not acting the way they want to and they can change their minds because they are aware of that. And that is as much of a help as, as anything because it stops you from going in a direction that you inherently really don't want to do. You don't want to be conflicted. Nobody wants to be conflicted. They want to be loving, and they want to love. And if it stops you from being conflicted, which is what it does for an awful lot of people who study this course. The Course in Miracles, through the concepts of teaching love and forgiveness, bring forth a man, when he walks back into society, who wants to give that love, who knows that that's what he'll be getting back. Whatever he gives, he'll be getting back. Love, through the course, is, it became a lot more unconditional, a lot more without restrictions or barriers or reservations about whom I give it to, how I give it to him, how often I give it to him, uh, where there's strings attached, where there's no strings attached. Just a real unconditional feeling of, uh, of, of goodness and peace, of uh, the only right thing to do was to love, regardless of what somebody would say or do or whatever their act was about, whether it was in prison or not, whether he was a guard or not, whether he was a free person or not. 
uh, whether it was my primary relationship with my wife or not. It, love just became very unconditional. Society often wants these men to be punished and wants to ostracize them and keep them locked up forever. First of all, most of them are not going to be locked up. They're going to come back out into the society. What we uh, feel is very crucial is what kind of men or women come back to the society. Are they people that are now have seen the error of their way? Have they eliminated the, uh, the things that have motivated them, the guilt and so forth? Can they eliminate those thoughts that makes them even want to be criminal? Can we make a difference so that they don't want to slide back into the cocaine world or the heroin world? Then from that world striking at society or showing their anger or their revenge. Atonement to me means being able to live with myself and having gone through uh, a period of not feeling good about that, I think the chorus allowed me to get comfortable now with what I choose to share and I think that it, uh, what I choose to share now and what I believe my purpose is in that sharing is my experiences, my life, uh, teaching, as it were, uh, that it is okay to love, that it is okay to uh, relinquish barriers and obstacles to love's presence, to allow yourself to experience your fear, because you're not going to die from it. And I'm still working on atonement. Little things keep cropping up now and from the past that I had forgotten about conveniently. And forgiving myself and continuing the atoning process, to get clean, to be cleansed, to be clear, and to be able to communicate that clarity. The course, bottom line, is uh, besides peace of mind and direction, is like inner strength. And it's about the determinations and the responsibilities and the challenges that we have in life. And they're all real, and yet they're all illusionary. One of the things I've learned from working with clients in psychotherapy is that they tend to get better when they take responsibility for their experience. And uh, the Course speaks to this very directly. It says simply, I am responsible for what I see. I choose the feelings that I experience, and I decide upon the goal I would achieve. And everything that seems to happen to me, I ask for and receive as I have asked. Now, that's, uh, that's quite a challenge if we're going to accept that at face value. But in fact, it gives us a sense of direction. It points out to us that we need to take responsibility for the feelings we have, and that if I'm a angry, at some level, that's a choice. It may be out of defensiveness, it may be out of fear, but that basically I can choose whether I want to release that anger, to work it through and move on, or whether I want to remain stuck in it, so to speak. And I think that's sometimes a problem, because in psychotherapy, we often emphasize the importance of expressing anger, but we forget that that's not an end point. When a person feels like a victim, it may be very appropriate for them to get angry about it. But it's also appropriate for them to release that and to move on so that to, in order to get in touch with our creativity, to be truly creative rather than reactive in our lives, we need to get beyond the position of victim and the position of adversary and angry uh, reactivity into a more creative view of what's possible in our lives, to really decide on the goal that I would achieve and to recognize that freedom of choice. Because as the Course says, we need to acknowledge that we are already free. A lot of the Course is about living in the world in a different way. Also a lot of it's about guilt. Two of the things obviously that cause the greatest degree of guilt in all of us here are sex and money. And while the Course takes positions on nothing, the Course is not a system of behavior. It, it, the Course is a system of mind changing. Really, I think what it has taught me regarding those two subjects is that sex and money are neutral things in which I invest my meaning. Like everything else in the world, the body, the world itself, sex, money, 
whatever else it would happen to be, each thing only has the meaning that my mind gives it. If I make sex a very important thing to me and make it something that I need, I'm giving power to sex that sex doesn't have. If I make money something very important to me, which I did for a good portion of my life, then I make money something that, is, that it really isn't. And I think the easiest way to say it is this. The Course in Miracles teaches you to live in the moment. In order to live in the moment, you have to do a couple of things. You must forgive so that you can trust. You must have no defenses so you don't feel that you're going to be attacked. But assuming that you can go through the sequence of no defenses, forgiveness of your brother for what he didn't do to you, and then trust, and you can live in the moment, then all those things become meaningless. Money becomes meaningless because living in the moment is the whole point. Money is a future-oriented thing. Sex becomes something that you do or you don't do. It's, if it's there and you should do it, you do it. If you do, it's not there and you don't do it, you don't do it. It doesn't become something that's more important than it should be. And unfortunately for us, way back for the story of Genesis on through the world, sex has become something that's almost like the serpent. We should hate the serpent, we should hate sex, we should feel guilty when we have sex, we should feel guilty if we have too much money, we should feel guilty if we have too little money. That's kind of absurd. So I think what the Course has taught me to do is to take one step back from those emotion-ridden things and recognize that the emotion that's in there, I put in there, and I can subtract it out. And then in doing so, I can see it in balance. And I think if there's anything that the Course would teach us over a long period of time is to become in balance. The Course is very definite about what the body cannot do. It says bodies try to join and to unite and they can't. A body is a tool for communication, and the best it can do is to try to join with that thought in mind. Hence, bodies will always be separate, minds never. We are one in mind. That which we do with our bodies is sometimes very suspect, and there's a lot of bad history involved, anywhere from killing it, to using it against somebody else in anger, including sex. We also overfeed it, we mutilate it, we paint it, we prune it, we get very involved in the looks of it and the management of it, and we forget who we really are. This is the ego's idol, the body. A Course in Miracles is not against joy, it's not against happiness, it's not against peace. It rather suggests that what we use the body for is very important. And the question that's raised over and over again in the student's mind of the Course is ask, what is this for? What is the meaning of everything one does? If it's for joining in the mind, if it's for demonstrating love, if it's for inclusion, if it's for sharing, then it's for love and one will feel peace. If it's for the opposite, one will feel only discomfort and pain. And so sexuality is sometimes an expression of this desire for joining. But the real work is to recognize that we are, in fact, already one, that we are joined at the level of spirit, that we are one mind, and that when we recognize ourselves in each other, when we recognize the Christ light within each other, then we truly acknowledge our oneness. And it is in this joining that healing occurs. The Course says that healing occurs when two minds recognize their oneness and become glad. It also says that all healing is released from fear and that all healing is released from the past. That, in fact, we need to recognize what we already know. Today, when so many people are concerned with the search for enlightenment, and the Course reminds us that enlightenment is but a recognition, not a change at all. Part of my work uh, as a clinician uh, in this county was uh, consulting with oncologists with children who uh, had very serious illness and uh, were dying. And I noted that many of these children oftentimes asked the doctor or nurse, this is way back now in 1975, uh, about their thoughts about dying and their fears about dying. And oftentimes the nurse and, and the doctor would just change the subject. 
And it occurred to me there needed to be a, a place where, where kids could really talk and, and, and have an honest reaction. Because oftentimes those same kids would find the person who was the most honest was the woman who was scrubbing the floor. And she would give an honest response. And uh, I gave a lecture back in New York uh, on uh, the prevention of cancer uh, and talking about some of the things I was doing on a one-to-one -one basis, uh, really utilizing course principles. And what occurred to me was I was to start, it was sort of like in my meditation on the plane coming back, I was to start a center that would make use of the course principles that would allow me to look at death differently. And really the children would teach me these spiritual principles. And I was just to be the catalyst for setting it up. And I set it up really based on the Course Principles, not saying to children, look, I have a better way of, of dealing with this than someone else, but I'd like your help. Can we be colleagues with each other about a, a different way of looking at the world? And maybe it would be possible if, if you got together with other children and could talk with them about their problems, you could end up helping each other far better than doctors and nurses and, and teachers. And so we started in that, in that way. Uh, the name Center of Attitudinal Healing actually makes use of many of the principles of the Course of Miracles. Because what, what, what is attitudinal healing except letting go of the negative thoughts of fear and anger and attack thoughts and having them be replaced with love that's always been there. So this is what really attitudinal healing is all about. And that's how the center started in 1975. I thought maybe it would last about a year, and uh, it continued to grow. We began seeing uh, not only children, we began seeing uh, brothers and sisters of, of children with cancer, and the parents and uncles and aunts and grandparents. And then we began seeing adults with the catastrophic illness. Get away from any kind of guilt you'd have, yeah. so you know, really free to make new yeah. decisions. Wouldn't that help a lot? There are now over 40 uh, centers uh, around the country, uh, in this country and in, a, in other countries, uh, centers of attitude and healing. I began going around talking about love and God, some things that we don't talk about in medical school. But the majority of doctors, um, they became very skeptical, very concerned, very wondrous. But what happened was that the families that we were seeing children who had catastrophic illness, that there was such rapid shifts in their uh, feelings. Their whole family structure had changed so rapidly that the, these very physicians that were very skeptical began to, to refer people to us. Um, a couple of years later, the American Medical Association came out and wrote an article about us on their front page of the newspaper that goes to 90,000 doctors, and it was a very positive article. And we began receiving letters from doctors and nurses uh, from all over the, all over the country. So there's been a real shift in, in the perception about, about our work. And one of the things that's been helpful to me is a, a quote from the Course that says, I'm not a body, I am free, for I'm still as God created me. The peace of God is everything that I want. The peace of God is my one goal, the aim of all my living here, the end I seek, my purpose, my function, and my life, while I abide where I'm not at home. And children at the center have really been greatly helpful to me at, at taking another look at the body and, and, and seeing the difference between life and death. One child who had sickle cell anemia named Carrie, I was asking him about what he thought about death. He'd come close to death many times. He said, well, Jerry, I think what happens when you die is that God has really created a library. And you're a book in his library. And what he does is he loans this book to your parents and it's on a loan basis. And when the due date is up, that book comes back into God's heart. So you're never really separate from God. And when your time's up, you just go home to, to, the, to the heart of God. And I thought, wow, what a beautiful way of looking at it. Sometimes we find ourselves in situations at the Marine Mammal Center where we suddenly see relationships that we have with each other, with these animals, with the whole planet Earth, that we're all joined, that there really are no separations. And I look at it that the opportunity to, to work with these animals, to, the opportunity to work in the healing process, is a healing process for ourselves and an energizing factor in how this place attracts people to come and work here and be a part of it. And all healing is a release from the past, from past perceptions, illusions of the past. I, I see in my own life a tremendous growth, especially over the last few years as I've been studying the Course in Miracles. 
that I've come to a point that I am at least able to see the baggage I'm dragging behind me and realizing that it's my choice to release that and that in releasing those illusions, and they are illusions because the past is over, it can touch us not, and the future is not, nothing exists but the present now, this holy instant now. And once one gets that, there's just a tremendous power because there, you are defenseless. There is no need to feel vulnerable to the world that you're joined with. And it's a wonderful healing process. And I think when we mirror that to each other, uh, it's non-stoppable. We're all in this together, whether we're doing our work here at the Marine Mammal Center or wherever we're working and wherever we're joining with people. And uh, it's, it's just marvelous. You know, in relationship to, to the work we do with the animals and as they come into us here, we give them names and we see the various personalities as we perceive them in each other or whatever. But the bottom line is, in our releasing them back out to sea, when we put them out into the wild, I think that's where I see the ultimate joining. It's unconditional love. And if we could only learn how to perfect this with each other, getting beyond the personalities, beyond all the things that, that can interrupt on a day-to-day -day basis and realize that that joining is there. And I see it when, when those animals go back out into the wild. You know, I need not know where they're going or where their next fish is going to come from or whatever. I only need to know that I am connected with them in a very unique way. And in the way that I am connected with them, I am connected with my brother and with every living thing on this planet. And the more I can raise my consciousness to identify with that without having to define it, what it is, the more I think I come close to an, to an understanding of what the life force is that, that moves us and what truly can affect changes uh, among people, to just realize that joining. And when we try to define it, I think that's where we start to push away and, and separate. The Course says that every opportunity properly perceived is an opportunity to heal. Every situation properly perceived is an opportunity to heal. So that uh, it means that we can take our psychological and spiritual work out of the consulting room into the world. And that, uh, in fact, as we begin to change our perception of the world, our experience changes too. Because the Course is not about um, learning a new intellectual thought system. It's about experience. And it says that uh, a universal theology is impossible, but a universal experience is not only possible, but necessary. I come from a Jewish family in Transylvania, which is the Hungarian-speaking part of northwestern Romania. I grew up in a town which was 100% Hungarian and where the Jews were an important minority. I come from a family that was quite wealthy, quite highly regarded, and yet were, were all very religious Jews. On the way to school and on the way back from school, almost daily, I got beaten up as a child because I was a Jew. I looked just like they did, I talked like they did, and they both beat me up because I was a Jew. I remember when I first saw an SS officer. I was not 13 or just turned 13. And I could not understand why anyone would have a uniform which was decorated with a skull and crossbones, as the SS did. They worshipped death. What was even more difficult for me is that they spoke German. And my grandmother, who was dearest of all to me, was of German-speaking heritage in Transylvania. She could barely speak Hungarian. And to me, the German language and the German culture represented her. And she was the kindest, the loveliest, the lovingest woman in the world. And she was the one that, among others, was murdered in Auschwitz. At that time, we tried to get ourselves papers, which in case of a, 
an escape of some sort would serve to uh, save our lives, namely that we were not Jews. And a Catholic priest uh, who took his life in, in his hands for doing this uh, agreed to christen us and give us papers as if we had been cradle-born Christians. And that was, even though I was not religious, so-called, I realized much later that it was a terribly traumatic experience for me. It was a total betrayal of my grandfather and grandmother. And so when the war was over, I was carrying all sorts of guilt. First, I found out what had happened to the family that had remained in Transylvania. We were in Romania proper. And all those were delivered to the concentration and then extermination camps. So 66% of our family were killed there. We who survived had to live with the guilt of having survived, perhaps because we had those false papers, perhaps because we turned our backs on our own kindred folk. And I had some major problems to deal with. One day it dawned on me that the Nazis didn't only almost destroy me by destroying most of my family, but that they, they left me with an incurable disease of hatred. And I didn't want that anymore. And that is perhaps that which made me stay in the course in spite of the terms which bothered me no end, in spite of the concepts which were terribly difficult for me to deal with and to be with because I wanted to have peace, I wanted to have happiness, and I thought, or had a, some kind of an instinct, that the Course would lead me out of this terrible impasse I was in. And the Course, in fact, did. Two things happened for me. One of them was that I discovered that every time I forgave just a little bit, something happened within, and I became less unhappy, at least. And so as I was forgiving the little Nazis, I was able to forgive the bigger Nazis and the bigger Nazis. And then in the end, I was able to forgive even Hitler. But I think what the Course would suggest, whether it's talking about somebody who's been brutally raped, or somebody whose family or member of a family has been brutally raped or killed, whether one's talking about the victims of the Holocaust uh, or the uh, starving people in Ethiopia or whatever that form, in the world is would not ask us to deny what we are seeing, not ask us to deny the pain that our bodies are going through, but would ask us to look at it through the eyes of the Holy Spirit, who would then teach us that regardless of what seems to be happening to us, that everything in this world is a learning lesson. There's a workbook lesson that says all things are lessons God would have us learn. And that the lesson for me, whether I'm a victim or I'm a victimizer, is that despite the seeming differences of our body and the seeming differences that, that our perceptions tell us, that we all remain still as God created us, and that we are all uh, separated and that we all have to return home together. And this, of course, would be a, a, a glaring difference uh, between uh, the Course's view of, quote, evil and sin in the world and the way most people in the world see it. There is a um, prayer or invocation in the text which uh, goes somewhat like this. I give you to the Holy Spirit as part of myself. I know that you will be released unless I want to use you to imprison myself. In the name of my freedom, I choose your release because I recognize that we can be released together. And I add my own only in there, that we can be released only together. And whenever I am in a place where I am fixed on something that someone did to me, or judge someone, or have trouble to let go of anything, I make use of that invocation and see them, in fact, being released along with me. I have a visual image, inward visual image of that. And it has worked miracles for me. When I started to read A Course in Miracles and recognize that to forgive is to overlook, that selective remembering helped in the process of forgiveness. To choose only the thoughts of love and forget those of aggression, fear, 
denial, anger. That in that attitude, based upon a spiritual concept, that we are not our bodies, but we are in truth spirit. At that point, I could understand what the Course meant when it said, to forgive is not to condone, it's not to make error real, but rather to recognize that what you thought someone has done to you has never in truth occurred. Has never in truth occurred was so startling to me because of course it occurs. We see it every day. We experience it every moment. But in truth, it's saying, in the metaphysical reality, in the spiritual truth, in God's world, it has not occurred. Only by shifting our thought from the ego's thought system to that of God can we dare to accomplish forgiveness. That's the bad news. <laughs> the good news is we have a friend, the voice within us, the eternal forgiver, the higher guide, the higher self, anything we choose to call it. And it's that, that great transformer within, that helps in the process of forgiving. So it became then very, very specific, the guidelines I was given for forgiveness. Number one, recognize I had a problem that I wasn't feeling peaceful, and that I was holding a negative feeling about someone. Recognize it. Bring it to the surface. Confront it. All within myself, of course. And the second, recognize that I wanted peace, that I really wanted to see it differently, that I wanted to change my mind. I didn't want to hold this grudge, this grievance, any longer. Number three, know that I couldn't accomplish this by myself meaning my small self, my ego self. Number four, turn it over to the higher self. Say, take this mess. I can't handle it. I really surrender it to you. I ask you to take it from me and to show me what true vision is. Now, when that happens, one can be sure that the situation is transformed, that one does see with different eyes I call it realize. I begin to realize what that other human being is to me, more than a brother or a sister, more than a friend. That person is myself. In that sense, I am not my brother's keeper. I am that other. No one can do anything to one's self when one is looking at the world through one's higher self. And that becomes a system of such safety and protection that it has great dividends. I had worked in the White House with a very peculiar assignment. Uh, I was a writer uh, under the administration of President Ford, and I was editorial liaison officer between Ford, Kissinger, and the National Security Council. And my job was to advocate the defense budget and the military weapons that were seen as required. Uh, in other words, to spread fear. My assignment also was to write the president's religious speeches of one another. I saw something of a dichotomy. And I also saw what was actually going on within government and in international affairs. I became so troubled by this that by the time I left the White House with the election of President Carter, I turned to prayer and meditation. And then the uh, Course of Miracles appeared, uh, delivered to me by Judith Scutch. At the time I received the Course, in 1978, I had been given a job by the Joint Economic Committee of Congress to look out into the 80s and try to describe the nature of the evolution or revolution in American values that would take place. And so I had a lot of advisors, a committee drawn from many different fields outside of the library, and we explored this. And it was for the first time that I suppose I had ever looked seriously at the notion of a kind of collective American consciousness 
because my life had really been dedicated to foreign and foreign defense policy issues. I was much more interested in China and the Far East and Europe and so forth. So I never really, I just took our country for granted. It was in the context of that work that I really became depressed. In effect, not only was I having a personal crisis in my life with my frustrated search for meaning, for personal meaning, but in my professional life as I was working with these people surveying where America was going, I began to encounter uh, signals, evidence of a profound alienation uh, among ourselves, American to American, alienation between Americans and some of their oldest institutions, and a kind of crisis of confidence and of identity that was emerging, not only in this country, but in Europe. The course can't bring peace to the world. People, people can bring peace. First inner peace, first peace within self, first to apply the principles inwardly before anything can happen externally peace in relationships uh, with those uh, near and close uh, emotionally, uh, with the co-workers, uh, the uh, transformation of personal relationships uh, in one's own neighborhood, in one's community, uh, that will lead to a movement in the world. But I, I do feel that the, the people in, in government, policy makers, are loaded with fear. Now fear is, is it dealt with, uh, uh, with great insight by the course. That the entrapment uh, by fear and the necessity to transmute that fear uh, into love, into understanding and compassion uh, for others uh, it, it, what can be a, a, a teaching instrument uh, for the individual could be uh, applied on a national scale. Uh, but first, the, the leadership of a nation is only a mirror image of the citizens. And when enough citizens uh, uh, begin opening and changing and seeing without fear, forgiving and loving, uh, we can have a national change. One of the questions that's often asked about the course is, does it have any relevance for dealing with the, the really big problems of our time, the fact that human survival and our planet are threatened? And I think that the answer is yes particularly if we look at our global problems and realize that all of them, whether they be population growth or starvation or pollution or nuclear weapons, for the first time in our history, each and every one of the major threats we're facing is human caused. And hence, it, they come from our own behavior and therefore from our own ways of thinking and perceiving and acting and relating to one another. In other words, what this means is that what we've thought of as our global problems are global symptoms, and they're symptoms of our individual and collective psychology and spiritual attitudes and behavior. And it's interesting that the course, which aims to help us relate more lovingly to one another, to let go our limiting belief systems about our the fact that we wouldn't be able to make an impact or make a difference, that it works to, to empower us in the world and with ourselves. All of the things the Course aims at doing actually also tackle and try to and, and tend to heal the psychological spiritual roots which underlie not only our own suffering but the suffering and troubles of the world as well. And we can gather and talk. As we all, a large body of people, began studying A Course in Miracles, there were those whose language was not English. And as they became more and more interested in and dedicated to learning this belief system, they felt the need to put it into their own language. Various individuals, self-appointed, who felt he or she had the skill to do this job, came forward and identified themselves and said, this seems to be what I am being inner guided to do. Would it be all right if I put this material 
into my own language. Well, of course it's all right, but who was to watch over it and who was to help guide it through its process? I almost forgot that it wasn't to be human, <laughs> but rather the source, which gave it in the first place. Does that have a, have a connotation, of a spatial connotation? The chorus is now being translated in, into almost a dozen languages. A great deal of loving attention is being given as each word, each phrase is discussed, alternatives come into view, they're discarded perhaps or used, but with great deal of care, it's evolving. I sometimes think that central casting has an incredible sense of humor to put people like us in the position of helping birth this along since we have absolutely no qualifications whatsoever for the job. But I guess that's just to reinforce the belief system that with God, all things are possible. The miracle real is the love that inspires them. The miracle 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 is the love that inspires them. Sie noch solo und ich bitte sie um die Liebe, die sie heilen würde, aber die sie sich selbst vorenthalten. In London, at Westminster Abbey, May 1985, ten years after A Course in Miracles was first published in the United States. At the invitation of Lillian Carpenter, wife of the Dean of Westminster Abbey, a new edition of A Course in Miracles was launched for Great Britain. Lillian, it absolutely astounded me last year in May when we came over to London to participate in the launch of the British edition of A Course in Miracles. And we sat here in this magnificent Jerusalem chamber. You told us something that startled me so much that I had chills up and down my spine. <laughs> I didn't realize that the King James Version of the Bible was translated in this room. Mm -hmm. And it seemed extraordinarily appropriate and there are other translations done here too, weren't there? Mm -hmm. Yes, the King James's and the Presbyterian Book of, of Common Prayer began here. And also the modern translation, which is also incredible that it should all come here. And um, when we had the Scottish people in here, we make them roar with laughter when we say, well, yours all started here. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think the significance is of having the launch of A Course in Miracles here in this room? I had no idea it was going to happen. No, I know. And it's it a miracle me. that it happened. Yeah, but how, but what, what is the significance to you of it happening in this particular place? Jerusalem, city well, of peace. Well, I think, first of all, uh, we were lucky that... Uh, we were here, and Edward Osteen. That's right. <laughs> that was the first <laughs> consolation. We were lucky. <laughs> and uh, then the second thing is that, that I'd had several groups here reading The Course of Miracles. And when I heard that the paperback was coming out, what more wonderful place than here in Jerusalem Chamber, where these early translations, and it seemed to me as though it was a continuing of the message, but bringing it fresh and new. The same wonderful message, but in the course of miracles set out in the way it is. Yeah. And this emphasis on love, which I feel is so important. And we speak so much about love in words, but it's how we use the word. It's something that we feel, and in the course of miracles, this brings it home to us so very much. And, and Bill, you know so much about this. Well, the course expresses it very simply when it says, teach only love, mm. for that is what, what you, you are. are. Yes, yes. And we begin to recognize that as we begin to teach what we want, 
then it becomes much more a part of us. Yes, yes. But yet it's got to be expressed through these, this body, hasn't it? This is sometimes the drawback, isn't it? It seems to we be. We make barriers around yeah. ourselves. But we can also go beyond them. Mm -hmm. And in that phrase, teach only love, for that is what you are. First time I heard that, I had to stop and think, what does that mean that's what you are? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, when you get beyond the feeling mm -hmm. that the body is all you are and it's all you have and recognize there is more and yes. that's within, then that's what you can extend. I think it's something that you have to struggle with all the time uh, with yourself. This uh, transformation and to me, anyway, it's, it, is a, it is an in, individual, personal thing, I think, for every one of us. And um, it may be very easy for some and not so easy for others, but I believe it's an ongoing thing. It's every moment, it can be a moment to express this and to feel it and to know it, that it's alive. It is something that's living, it's real. It's difficult to, I believe, to put your finger on it, to uh, write about it, but Helen did. <laughs> <laughs> when the course began in 1965, Helen and I were naturally curious as to why it had come into our lives at that time. And we received a special message which said essentially that uh, the world was in an increasingly difficult and deteriorating situation and that there was a celestial speed up underway. It's and a that lovely that remark. Yeah. Celestial mm -hmm. speed up. And that we were asked to play our part in this celestial speed up as many other people were. Our part was to do this particular assignment which involved A Course in Miracles. And it also said, didn't that I remember Helen telling me, that this was only one of many, many ways. Many you know, ways. Course in Miracles starts, <laughs> yes. but this is a Course in Miracles. It is a required course. Yes. But it doesn't mean that this is the only, only way, way in the world. No, it no. means rather the greater course of learning mm. who we mm. are in truth. Yes. This and word speed, it, can you say that mm. sentence again? The speed. The celestial speed up. The celestial speed up. Now, this is what I believe is happening. Uh, years and years ago, this couldn't have happened. We'd either been put uh, in the fire or tortured in some way for bringing out this wonderful book, Course in Miracles. But I believe the time is ripe all over the world, in every corner of the earth, there's someone reawakening. And we don't know what the speeding up has done within us because we are able now to accept it, which we wouldn't have been able to do even, even 40 years ago, 30 years ago, we wouldn't. Do you think that, Bill? What do you think about that? Well, certainly I would not have been prepared. <laughs> There's no question of that. No. Certainly nor I. No, but I think there was some kind of evolution in world consciousness yes. in the middle 60s, which perhaps made this particularly appropriate. And so I think this, this one of time, it is the right time. It's come at the right time. Now, whether it can transform, we know it can transform. And we don't ask whether it will or can. It will transform many, many lives all over the world. I'm absolutely certain of that. Well, we, we know that as we change our minds, mm. other people are helped to change their minds. Mm. And this is the kind of chain reaction which takes place. Yes. The change has taken place in ordinary people yeah, that's without, without any political uh, thing at all. The ordinary person in the street is changing and the time is ripe for this to be received by them. I think the Course says this very effectively. The mind that means that all it wants is peace must join with other minds, for that is how peace is obtained. And I think this expresses the spirit of joy and peace that is a constant theme throughout the Course. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think this is part of the joining that we're all experiencing and the joy that goes with that joining. I want the peace of God. To say these words is nothing. 
but to mean these words is everything. The mind that serves the Holy Spirit is unlimited forever. In all ways, beyond the laws of time and space, unbound by any preconceptions, and with strength and power to do whatever it is asked. <laughs> 